everything I've done as a person, uh, my time in Afghanistan, my time as a police officer, all of that stuff creates who I am, and I bring all that into my performances. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. James Healy Jr. is on the show. James is a professional actor who has appeared on television series like Judging Amy, Will and Grace, 24 with Kiefer Sutherland, Disney's Even Stevens, That's So Raven, Dynasty, Law and Order Special Victims Unit, Manhunt, and Vice Squad Atlanta, among many others. His films include The Hate You Give, Run, Hide, Fight, and Puppet Master, The Littlest Reich with Thomas Lennon. We actually had fun talking about his experience on set in the Puppet Master movie and how he was able to make his character more dynamic by adjusting his approach to the dialogue. His upcoming film, Reagan, stars Dennis Quaid and the lovely Penelope Ann Miller. If you look at James's IMDb page, you'll notice some gaps that span years, but that's not because he was out of work. It's because he was in a different line of work. James was in law enforcement for over 30 years and was even a police chief. We talk about how his experience in law enforcement and using firearms has resulted in consulting gigs on movie sets. We also talk about why James frequently plays roles of folks in positions of authority, like doctors, police officers, school principals, and fathers. I asked James whether he thinks his experience as a police officer influences the types of parts he lands. We also talk about his audition process, how he finds parts to audition for, and the challenges he faces trying to obtain the holy grail for television actors, a recurring role. Over the last nearly two years on this podcast, I haven't had the opportunity to interview many actors, so it was nice to sit down with James and learn about that world. So without further ado, here's my chat with James Healy Jr. James Healy Jr., welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. I uh, really appreciate you uh, taking on me. I don't know how I earned this distinction. Well, that's a good place to start. I think we should mention, give honorable mention to Stephen Joyner, who connected us. Yes, yes, indeed. I haven't, uh, I haven't spoken to Stephen in a few weeks, but it's been kind of slow. Yeah, because of COVID, there was no really reason for us to speak. Right. How did you meet Stephen? I think it was Instagram. Uh, he reached out to me on Instagram or something, and uh, we started just talking back and forth. And he said, I'd, I'd be interested in in helping you with your career. And I told him, I said, well, I've thought about getting a publicist before, but don't really know that I need one right now. And then, of course, because I haven't really worked in the last eight months. Now, I've done two films back to back just recently, but... Uh, there's just not a lot of anything going on. So right. I They're said, just starting just, to start it back up, yeah, right? Exactly. And it just started back up. And yet at the same time, now it's shutting back down because we appear to be having another wave. Right. Yeah. So what films did you work on recently? The two back to back films? Um, there was a movie called Ida Red, uh, which was shooting in Oklahoma and it stars uh, Josh Hartnett and uh, Melissa Leo. Nice. And I actually, on that one, I was a uh, crew. I didn't perform uh, through a mutual friend. He uh, asked me if I would go up and be the armorer uh, and police advisor. With my law enforcement background, I have a lot of experience with weapons. So I was the guy on set showing other actors how to use an MP3, an AK-47, a M4 rifle, how to clear or if they have a jam or a misfeed. And I was in charge of all the weapons. Oh, fun. Yeah. And then the next movie I just did uh, was a movie called Reagan, uh, starring uh, Dennis Quaid. I, not that I confuse him with his brother Randy, but sometimes I accidentally say Randy. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis Quaid's uh, starring as uh, Reagan. And oh. I was cast as uh, the U.S. Air Force General down in the, uh, what do they call it? The Not the ready room, the bunker. Um Situation room. Okay. Is, uh, you know, dealing with him and the possibility of this Soviet nuclear threat. 
wow, two talk about fun projects to be on. And you just you just made the cutoff before they shut it down again. <laughs> so Yeah, well, they're still filming. This was uh, a 60 day shoot, I think. But um I went up and was tested immediately. And then you have to get your negative response and then you get um, wardrobe fitting and then you wait another day and then they test you again and then you get to go on set. Wow. And with the way they're doing everything now, if you're not on camera or speaking in a scene, you have to wear your mask. So anytime the camera's running that I could be on scene, I would take my mask off. If I had dialogue while I was off camera, I would take my mask off. But if I was just in the scene because I was in the scene, I couldn't get out of there for some reason, I had to have my mask on. Hmm. A lot of hand washing and sanitizing. I'm glad to hear that they're implementing those, those procedures because it's so important that we get back to some type of normalcy in terms of just mm-hmm. people making a living and getting yeah. our economy up and running. And you have to balance that with the fact that this is a, a deadly pandemic with no known wide widely available treatments anyway or vaccine but um but good work getting those uh those gigs on those two movies well the like i said the first one was uh, just a crew job so i got that through networking with a friend that was hired as the company excuse me the second one was um I mean, I I auditioned for it. I'm not going to put myself down and say I didn't get it because I'm not talented. But I also knew the director. So I think having known the director, having worked with him on a few other projects might have helped. Because at one point, um, I had read for a role and he sent me a message saying, hey, did you read for this? We're going to be shooting this in Oklahoma. And I said, yeah, I did. I read for this role. And he wrote, that role's been cut. You need to call back the casting director. <laughs> so I had my agent contact the casting director and say, hey, my role's been cut if there's something else I'm right for. And could you mention that Sean and I have known each other since the 90s? And nice. she did, and I got a role. So Good, good work. Maybe it was a 50-50. Maybe part of it was talent. Maybe part of it was just knowing the right people. Well, I hey, think it, that's showbiz. Hey, and I think that's just any industry that you're in. I'm uh, My day job, I'm an attorney. And who you know, who you've worked with, those connections, those communities, those tribes that you form, they're, I think they're important no matter what profession you're in. Sure. Yeah. So how, how important it is, has it been for you historically since, well, you started acting at the age of, uh, well, your first film About role 15. was in 15, right? Yeah. So with 40, the, what is that? 45 years? Right. So how how much have you relied upon connections to help uh, move forward in the industry and and, uh, build up your resume? Not much. Um, I've tried to network. There are, uh, let me just go back. I've got an agent here in Texas. I've got an agent in Atlanta, agent in New York, agent in Chicago. My manager's in Los Angeles. And I have a place in Texas where my home is. And then I have an apartment in Atlanta. I rent a room in the other cities, uh, usually with other actors. You know, there's three or four of us in the in the house or the apartment. And so I rent a room. So I always have a place and I do local hire uh, acting, which means they don't pay to fly me to New York. I have to get myself there because I'm considered local. Um So I haven't networked as well as I probably should have, although I've tried, especially here in Texas. There's a lot of filming going on here. Now, some of it's non-union, and I'm a member of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, but I'm just, I'm not doing very well. Most of my jobs have come through what's referred to as a workshop situation. Uh, I, when I moved to Los Angeles in the 90s, I would go to these places. They bring casting directors in. You pay to go in and learn. I mean, that's the idea. It's a learning environment. You sit in this classroom with another 15 or 19 other, depending upon the class size, actors. And the casting director introduces themselves, says, this is who I am, who I work with, what I'm working on. They give you a scene. You go out, you work on the scene, you come back, you perform it. And you hope that they'll think of you 
in the future when your agent submits you for a role and they'll bring you in. Mm. That's where most of my work comes from. Now, huh. the problem is some people call that a paid audition and they have to put in writing and say up front, this is not an audition. You are not here to get a job. You are here to learn. The problem is some people look at it as a paid audition, and then when they don't get an audition, they get mad and they say, well, I paid for this and I never heard from this person. Mm. Well, maybe you're not right for a role. Maybe you just suck. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can't act. You know, maybe it's just not written for you to be in this business, or, or maybe it's just bad timing. I book more work now in my 50s than I ever did when I was in my teens and 20s and 30s. I was at the wrong time in this business, but that's everybody's story, right? You know, everybody, they hire the, they were hiring people that were, when I was a kid and I graduated college, I was a theater major in high school and college and I graduated college and I told my agent, I'm going to Los Angeles or New York. And she said, don't do that. Stay here, get some more film credits, get some more experience and then go because you won't work until you're in your thirties. You'll spend 10 years out there doing nothing. Well, while I was waiting to become 30 and go out and become a movie star or a Broadway star, they discovered the whole 90210 generation. Mm. So then all of a sudden they were casting 16, 17, 20 year olds, or even 22, 25 year olds to play 16 and 17 year olds. Um, so my timing was just off and I worked, I was very fortunate. And then I get to the point where now I'm competing against guys who are, I'm, I'll am i be 59 in December, and I'm competing against guys who are my age or older. Sometimes they look older. Uh, I like to think I have good genes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the ego in me thinks I don't look like I'll be 60 in a year. Um, so I lose out parts to people because they're older. They look older. They look more weathered sometimes. Right. That's that's fascinating. So it's not Out. networking as much as it is networking within the business. Like Lou Diamond Phillips and I are really good friends. I would never ask Lou to get me a job or book me on a... He's doing Prodigal Son in New York, you know. I, that's just not the kind of person I am. If he wants to offer to help me, which many years ago he introduced me to his manager when I was living in Los Angeles, that's different. I'm, I'm just not the type of person to say, hey, we're longtime friends, you owe me, or you right. should do this for me. That's not me. That's You're not, not trying to I exploit am. connections and friendships. Exactly. For your I've own got game. several people who are, you know, even, even in other professions that are important people, and I've never, never used my friendship for that. So how did you make that connection and friendship, develop that friendship with Lou Diamond Phillips? We went to college together. Uh, we were at the University of Texas at Arlington uh, in the theater department. I was a oh. theater major in high school and college. Oh, so you kind of came and, up together. Yeah. And it just it happened that I went to UTA. I actually had a scholarship to a college up in um, Wisconsin that had a really good theater school. And my father's company that he had worked for for many years went out of business and he lost his job and they couldn't afford it. They just said, we can't afford for you to go somewhere else. You're going to have to go to school here. So as fortune had it, um, Lou and I worked together for many years doing a lot of shows. And that's also how I met my wife. So it was good that I stayed home. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was fate. So... Let's go back to this workshop issue, because from a practical standpoint, what I like to give to my listeners is practical advice for mm -hmm. people that are interested in acting. Uh, maybe they are acting, but they're looking for ways to get opportunities. Can you tell us more about these workshops? How do you find out about them? How do you sign up for them? How much do they cost? And actually, how effective are they for getting your name out there? Well, the effective part, that's that's difficult because it really just depends upon how good you are, how experienced you are. You know, a lot of people use them to do exactly what they're designed for. You go in and you meet someone and you learn from that casting director. 
it's it's always the same. Uh, there's always going to be someone that says, how do we stay in touch with you? How do, you know, what are your pet peeves? What do you look for? What do you hate that an actor does? And that's fine. You know, there's always someone going to ask those questions. So what you're really doing is you're going in there with the anticipation of learning something to help you and your craft. And then at the same time, you will hopefully network with them in a way that when your agent submits you for a role, now when they see your picture come across their desk, or in this case, now we're in the you know, computer generation, your picture's coming across a computer screen, you're not just an empty face. You're someone that go, oh, there's, you know, there's Dave, there's Bob, there's Mary. I know them. They were in a workshop. They were really good. I think they should get an opportunity to read for this. Hmm. So that's where that'll come from, is, is you're just hoping. Uh, but as far as how to find them, they're all over. They're in the trades paper. There's, you know, well, it used to be called Stage West uh, or Backstage West. There's Backstage and there's um, the Dramatist magazine. And you would just look at for those locations. Since I've been doing them for a long time, that's the first thing I look for when I go to a new city. Uh, in New York, I was doing uh, the Actors Connection. In Los Angeles, I do one-on-one -on -one and in the act. I used to do real pros. That was a really good place that I did them. Uh, TVI, when I first got out there, I did workshops there. You just, through other actors and through publications, you find out where these places are. And sometimes you have to audition. Um, those are the ones I prefer because they're weeding out the people that are not as experienced. Because when you're doing a workshop, you don't want, especially if it's like, let's say you're in Atlanta and you have a casting director who's come to teach a class in Atlanta from Los Angeles. There could be the perception already that you're not as prepared as an LA actor. And if you have people in there that aren't, it makes it it makes it look bad on the whole uh, class, much less the population of actors in Atlanta. They think they're not of the caliber that New York and L.A. actors might be, which is not true at all, because most of us have lived or been or come from. There's a lot of people moving to Atlanta from uh, Los Angeles now because there's been so much work there. Oh, I've, yeah, I've heard that. I've talked to a lot of folks who actually live in Atlanta, cinematographers, uh, actors, and there's a lot of East Coast action right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, my point of reference for Atlanta, I think, is Walking Dead, uh, mm -hmm. which is shot there. But um, so much is happening in Atlanta because of the tax incentives, I've heard. And right. um, it's interesting how it's moving from Los Angeles to Atlanta, especially in the television realm. But um, what a brilliant synergy that is to have casting directors teaching classes because what, what it gives them is that supplemental income, probably, obviously. Sure. Uh, but also, they're getting exposure to new faces, so they can incorporate that into their quiver. Um, and just more connections they're making with people that are out looking for jobs. And then the actors who sign up for the classes are getting exposure to the folks who actually make the decisions. Exactly. And um, I, did, I interviewed a casting director. The only casting director I've talked to on this show is Matthew Barry who is uh, Nick Cassavetti's uh, casting director. And so mm -hmm. he did The Notebook and Alpha Dog and all of Nick's movies. Oh, yeah. Um, and he has acting classes in Los Angeles. So it totally makes sense now <laughs> that you talk mm -hmm. about this connection. As you may have noticed, there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes. And for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place. Our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy, just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks, and now back to the interview. So I'd like to know more about your straddling the fence between, if that's, if that's the right way of talking about it, but straddling the fence between law enforcement and... Uh, or the vacillation back and forth between law enforcement and acting, and how it seems that your your law enforcement background has really informed your 
choices and also the choices of casting directors in terms of the roles that you're getting because you really seem you seem to be picked for roles not necessarily police officers all the time but certainly people of authority mm-hmm. medical doctors detectives psychologists right. uh, military folks where do well, you think that's the that kind comes of roles from? that someone like me is going to get anyway most of your supporting uh, what would they refer to as a co-star or supporting type role in a film or episodic television are going to be doctor, lawyer, reporter, dad, you know, psychologist. Yeah. So I, I, I book a lot of those roles. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of guys out there playing cops that have never been a police officer or a military person. They just, they just look the role. Um, yeah. When you're my age, my level. I mean, if I were a star, if I were a recognizable name or face, then, you know, I could be doing anything. But doing the supporting and co-star type roles that I'm going to primarily get. Now, I, I, I say this. I do get to read for series regulars. I do get to read for guest star roles. Like when I did Law & Order SVU, I played a dad. That, that was a guest star role. So I'll get those opportunities. But most of what you're going to see the non-recognizable face and name people out there, they're going to be the mom, the doctor, the lawyer, the reporter, the nurse. You know, those are the kind of roles we're going to read for anyway. Has it helped me getting some of the roles that I've gotten over the years because of my law enforcement background? Oh yeah, of course. Um, they are. They like the fact that I can come in and bring a genuine reality to the performance that maybe somebody else couldn't do. They've used me on set a few times as an advisor to ask me a question. How would this scene differ? How would you do it differently? Is this play right? I did a movie uh, three years ago. In fact, I posted it on Instagram today. It was three years ago. I was on set uh, called Trial by Fire, and Ed Mm. Zwick was the director. I saw that post. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Ed Zwick directed Courage Under Fire and um, Glory, you know, uh, mm. uh, Jack Reacher, you know, nice. he's, he's, he's big time director. Mm-hmm. And he, in fact, Lou and him, because of Courage Under Fire, he had told Lou that I was on set and, or Lou had told him that I was going to be on set with my police background. So he came over and asked me, he says, hey, you know, I'm Ed Zwick and I'm James Healy. How are you? Great. Uh, Lou told me that you were a police officer, so I got a question. How does this scene play for you? And I told him, I said, this isn't how we would do this, but I understand you've got to, you know, it's theatrical. You've got to do certain things for film and television. He said, well, what would you do? I explained what we would do, and I said it would take too long to do what we're doing, so why don't we modify? And it was a felony traffic stop. If For the people that don't know what that is, that's when the officers are behind you. They step out, they order you to turn off the car, remove the key, step out of the car, get on the ground. You know, that's a felony traffic stop. It would take too long to do it the way it was supposed to be done, but we could modify it and make it look real. Mm. So we set it up, we rehearsed it, he loved it, and it made it into the film that way. Nice. Right, so you're like a, a consultant. So they get really two, two for the price of one. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, when I show up, uh, I did a film years ago and... <laughs> I, I I walked over to the property master and I'm putting my leather, I was already in the uniform from wardrobe and I'm putting my leather gear on from the property master. And he's like, I'll be with you in just a second. I got these other guys I got to set up. Some extras background that were there. And he turned around and looked at me and I was done. I had it all on. And he's like, well, okay, how did you know? And I said, well, I'm a cop. And he's like, well, help me. Cause I've got like 20 background police officers. You can help me dress the rest of these guys. So then suddenly I became a property master uh, assistant <laughs> on set as well. Cause I could go help the other guys put their stuff on. That's awesome. Well, speaking of the uh, positions of authority that you've played, you played a teacher in even Stevens, right? <laughs> yeah. A recurring role there. And, and my daughter works on this show, works on the podcast and helps me with uh, research. And she was super excited when she saw that uh, oh. you had a recurring role because that was her, literally her favorite Disney show mm-hmm. um, or, you know, that Disney style show back in, in the nineties. And uh, so when you moved to Los Angeles, did that happen pretty quickly right after you got there in, in 98? 
Actually, we moved there twice. We moved there December of 95, and I booked a job, one of those like ABC after school specials. And uh, it was Sean, the director of the movie I just did, who is the creator behind Shia LaBeouf's Even Stevens. Ah, okay. So again, that's where those, you know, having worked with people before comes in handy. And the casting director, Joey Paul, uh, did this ABC after school special. She did uh, his Even Stevens, uh, this movie that she's that they did now, this Reagan film. She's the one that got um, uh, John Voight and Dennis Quaid and Penelope Miller. She gets the names. Mm. And then somebody else does the supporting roles. And then like in this case, there was a, a gentleman named Chris Freihofer in Oklahoma. He does the local hire casting uh, for people that are going to be hired locally in that area to play roles. Um, so did it happen quickly? I would say I was fortunate. I know a lot of actors who went to Los Angeles and didn't work for a year after they've got, got there. Or, you know, they arrived and in five years have booked four jobs. I was there three months and I booked this ABC after school special. I got there in December. By February, we were filming this thing. And I had met the casting director, Joey Paul, uh, in a class. I took her class. I ended up sometime later actually becoming the assistant in the class. I ran camera for her. It was an on-camera acting class, so I Hmm. would run camera. But I met her in this class, so then she brought me in for the audition, and I booked booked the job. And then over the years, we've developed a a friendship. Um, So... Yeah, I guess it did happen quickly. I, I booked that job. I booked some more work. I did. Oh my gosh, uh, I was trying to think of the the time I was there. Um, I did that, and then I think maybe one of the next things I did was news radio. Oh, yeah. Phil Hartman. With yeah, what a what a wonderful person he was. And then um, we actually moved back to Texas, um, and I was miserable, and so I went back to Los Angeles. And that was ninety eight. And that was in 98. And yes, I was brought in and had a recurring role on that. And I did Judging Amy and uh, The Division and Profiler. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 was, I was fortunate. I mean, even just like when I moved to Atlanta, I, this, I apologize to your listeners, this sounds egotistical, but I wasn't in Atlanta three months, two months, and I booked my first film. Now, understandably... I have a lot of experience by that time. I have a really good resume. I had no problem getting an agent and booking work quickly. When you come from New York or Los Angeles with the kind of credits that I have, yeah, you're given that opportunity maybe a little bit quicker than someone who, you know, two years ago decided to become an actor and they're just living in Atlanta at the time or living in Dallas at the time and decided you're going to be given a little bit more of an opportunity because of of your background, your training, your experience, and your knowledge. You've proven that you can, you don't want to take somebody and put them on a set if they're not proven. Right. You know, and that's why classes and workshops and getting to know, you know, a casting director may cast you in one line and then you go in and you, you're you on time, you hit your mark, you say your line, you stay out of the way. They don't have anybody calling and saying, oh my gosh, this guy was horrible. He kept getting in everybody's way. They're not going to bring you back. Here they go. Okay, this guy has been on set of news radio. He's been on the set of Will and Grace. He's done major productions. We trust him to go on this movie set with Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, you know, right. Jennifer Lawrence. Is you're a professional. Not, not make a fool of yourself or right. them because you're making a fool of them too. Yeah. I mean, clearly looking at your IMDb, I'm, I'm scrolling through it. I've, I've studied over the last week. It's just pretty impressive how many really um, popular shows and and movies you've been a part of and they're it's not all law enforcement it's it's not all special victims unit or or things like that i mean talk about an eclectic career uh (laughs) comedies and you know will and grace and dallas and dynasty and general hospital and manhunt and uh this is this is if i was a director or a casting director if i'm looking at this filmography i immediately know that you're a professional and thank you you know you're going to be an asset to any type of project that we're going to go forward with so good for you this is really well, exciting stuff i i mean i yes i want more 
I want to go to that next level. You know, uh, I want to be a series regular and I don't, I don't care. I'll, I'll be the Lieutenant at the precinct that's in every episode that only has one or two scenes every episode. Uh, you know, and then maybe one or two episodes throughout the year, I've got a bigger role. And uh, but I'm the lieutenant over the two younger detectives that the show surrounds. I'll play a cop the rest of my life. I just like most actors, I just I want to work. Yeah, you know, and uh, I want the right roles to come along. What's funny though is I have friends that, and my wife gets on to me about it too. They're like, "You don't appreciate what you get," because I don't make it a big deal. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I just booked this film. Uh, Well, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's my job, right? right? Why should I, why should I? Now, if you called and said, James, you just booked a series regular. Uh, You're going to be in every episode, uh, you know, 22 episodes. Uh, You know, uh, Mariska Hargitay loved you when you were on there. They want you to come back and become a recurring and that recurring will become a series regular. Okay, great. You're on a hit show with a major network. I'm going to get a little excited. But when I book dad, <laughs> cop number three, right? you know, reporter, uh, when I did the dynasty, and this is the new dynasty, not the old dynasty. This is the new one that's on CW. Um, my agent called and said, you know, you booked the job. And I'm like, okay, good. Well, I wasn't excited because the role was written as angry neighbor or angry tenant. I mean, that was the character name, you Mm -hmm. know, disgruntled tenant. The guy (laughs) comes to the door and knocks on the door and I'm like, yeah, what? No. Yeah. Well, when I get there, it has a name. Well, you should have seen my face because I get there and I look at the script and it says Terry. I'm like, oh, I've got a name. (laughs) So my IMDB page actually says Terry. It makes it sound like you're something on not just reporter, not just cop, not just doctor. Just that little difference makes an actor feel so much better, you know, about what they're doing. But That's yeah, awesome. I need to be, I need to be more excited. I need to be more appreciative because I've got friends who are like, I want to be where you're at. I mm-hmm. want to be booking 10, 12, 15 jobs a year. I want to be having seven, 10, 15, sometimes, you know, when it happens, auditions a week. Mm-hmm. And I get that. I'm at this level. Isn't that though, really what as human beings, we're all struggling with is the comparison to others. Sure. It really, and I think just from a ph- philosophical standpoint, that's where we struggle to find uh, fulfillment and happiness, that feeling of fulfillment and happiness. Because if you're constantly looking at what others are doing, you're never going to be happy. You know, the, the shortstop for the Yankees that's making $3 million a year should be grateful for the $3 million a year. But if the shortstop for the Dodgers is making $4 million, they're miserable uh, with that comparison. And I would imagine that acting is no different than any other profession in life. And um, But but it sounds like you have a really healthy balance of that ambition where you're you're looking for that series regular uh, and looking for a, a step up the ladder, so to speak, but you're also at peace with the fact that, Hey, you're, you're happy to play a cop the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm proud of my background. I mean, I've studied theater in high school and college. I've been in acting class. I teach acting. In fact, right before this, I, I was zooming, uh, with one of my clients. I teach, you know, of course it has to be not in person now, but everything I've done as a person, uh, my time in Afghanistan, my time as a police officer, all of that stuff creates who I am. And I bring all that into my performances along with my acting training. So I'm, I'm more than happy and proud of everything I've done. Do I want more? Sure. Do I compare myself to other people all the time? And I, I, I shouldn't, I, there's a series on right now. Uh, it's the new movie, The Right Stuff. It's a mini series done by the History Channel and it's showing on uh, Disney, Disney Plus. And I've read for two roles in that. And I've watched the first couple of episodes and I've seen the two people that got the job. And immediately I go, okay, they're good. I, they didn't do anything different than I did. 
So why did I get the role? Why did they get the role? <laughs> yeah. And the only thing I could think of is, so I look him up on IMDb. Oh, okay. Well, this guy's got a lot of credits. He's, you know, and he was a recognizable face. Okay. Uh, you know, this other guy, not so much. But they're both, one's like three years older than me. The other one's like six years old. Okay. So they're older than me. All right. Maybe. But you know me, because of this, the first thing I think of is they got hair. Mm. They don't see the ball. They don't see the part bald. They don't see it, you know, they don't see this guy being a ball. They got, you know, they got hair, which is why I have hair. It's in a box. It's in the closet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I can, I can put it on when I need to. Nice. I call it my hard top convertible look. Uh, you know? I saw yeah. that on your YouTube channel, the, the hard top and the, the soft top. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, have hair will travel. Right. Um, and, you know, as an actor, we do those things because we want someone to go, I can look this way. I don't have to look like this ugly, you know, middle-aged bald guy. I can look like a eh, maybe semi-attractive or ugly guy with hair, <laughs> uh, middle-aged guy, whatever, whatever your preference is. Yeah. You know, uh, because they're like, oh, well, they could put hair on you. They are not going to get a hair piece for me. I'm not important enough. Yeah. I'm not at that level yet. Not a leading get, man yet. Well, when you get, I mean, Drew Carey was a leading man in his own series. And who would have ever thought, you know, that an overweight guy with bottle coat glasses would be a leading man, even if it was a sitcom. Right. So you never know. I mean, I can't say that I won't ever be the lead on a series. You can't because you just don't know what they're going to be looking for. What, you know, there are women out there that actually think I'm attractive. I mean, <laughs> I, I know. So it could happen. But they're not going to get a hairpiece for me. Now, if I were, I would just, I'm trying to think of uh, an actor, but it just one of those people that you see in every movie, in every TV show, he's, he's that recognizable face mm -hmm. and name. Uh, you may not even know his name, but you know his face and you know, oh my God, he was in, oh, 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 he was in that thing. Right. Then, yes, they, they're going to put a hairpiece on me, you know? Uh, obviously if I were a lead actor or a series regular, then they could do that. But when you get to that point where, um, uh, and I just, I'm, t all right. Uh, do you know who JT Walsh is? No. Okay. Well, he, he's, uh, he's passed away now, but, um, he was in, uh, a few good men with mm. Tom Cruise okay. and Jack Nicholson. He was the major who sits in the back of the car with Tom Cruise and tells him, oh, this is what's going he, he on. He died of a heart attack. Yeah. He died of a heart attack. He yeah, was in, uh, you know, he was in Sling Blade in he the was a Nut great, House with great, great actor. actor. Yeah. Great actor. Okay. But that's J.T. Walsh. That's the guy where you go, you know, uh, what was you he? Don't you don't know his name. You don't know his name. Yeah. But you just know he's in everything. You know? Yeah. He's in everything. And you go, they'll put a hairpiece on him. They'll put a wig on him. They'll do something because who, who he is, they're not going to put hair on me. So I've got the hair so I can show them that that's an option. So when I audition for something and my agent sends it to me and says it's 40s to 50s, I've got to look at it and go, 40s to 50s, do I do it with or without hair? If it's a cop role, I'm doing it without the hair. Mm -hmm. If it's a lawyer, if it's something, you know, I might go ahead and, and, and throw the hairpiece on. If it's a dad, I might throw the hairpiece on. If it says 50s to 60s, I'm not putting the hairpiece on. Yeah. Speaking of dad roles, I mm -hmm. watched uh, this morning, I watched The Puppet Master oh, uh, yeah. movie with Thomas Lennon. And the, and the reason I went to the, because I always like to watch uh, some of the, I mean, with you, it would be impossible to watch everything that you've been in <laughs> because no, you, it, you've been in so many different you, things. You just got to fast forward to the good part and go, <laughs> oh, 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 I missed him. It was so fast. I missed him. No, but I, I do I did go through your your demo roles and I did look at various um, roles that you've you've been in over the years. But I was drawn to the puppet master role not because I'm a huge fan of horror. I do mm -hmm. like horror films, but I was looking at your Twitter and I saw that Thomas Lennon follows you on Twitter, mm -hmm. and I was like, mm -hmm. how does so that you had two um, pretty big accounts that were following you the the Mindy Project mm -hmm. and Thomas Lennon. I'm like, what's the connection to Thomas Lennon? Because I love Thomas Lennon from lieutenant dangle oh yeah from reno, reno 911. 911 i mean classic yeah. role so um and i've interacted with him a little bit on on twitter and he's a nice guy but um, he's not just he's not just talented the man is smart and a lot of people don't realize he wrote him and his partner wrote the night at the museum movies 
the Smithsonian movies. I and did stuff. not realize yeah. that. See, yeah. I haven't I dug. Mean, he's he's a writer that deep creator as well. Very smart. Wow. Yeah. So, and that's another guy I really want to talk to on the show because I I love his work. I love everything he's done, uh, but I have not looked at his writing. I've only seen him as an actor. So yeah. that's another layer there that I need to look at. But yeah, I, I looked at the, um, I watched the the Puppet Master movie, and 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 it's it's funny because I think they they sort of lean into how ridiculous the premise is. Of course, um, yeah. and then they they get Thomas Lennon, who has this he has this constant ability to be very quietly hilarious with the lines, the delivery of his lines. And that that scene with you, where you're disappointed in the fact that he's not with this girl anymore, and, and <laughs> the disgruntled father, the disgruntled I, I play, father. I play angry, disgruntled, um, not enthusiastic roles. Right. At all, apparently, the disappointed dad. We have all yeah. seen a disappointed dad. You do really well with that role, uh, but that exchange that you have with him was just hilarious. Especially his line at the end, where he's like. I'm sure you meant that with love, Dad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. And what's what's funny about that for me was the director. Um, they 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 just wanted my character to be a, an ass, just yeah. just be an. Ass. In fact, he would say to me, "Douchey," like a douchebag. He'd mm-hmm. go, "Just be more douchey. I need be be more douchey. Do douchey." And I felt like I was being very one dimensional, you know, and. So that little smirk I do at the end when he says, I'm sure that was meant to be, you know, better than it was or nicer than it was. I give him that like, "Hmm, yeah, sure. Kind of, that was just totally me going, I've got to do something here so this guy isn't just a dick. Yeah. You know, the whole time. Yeah. It's more complicated. You're a more complex character at that point. I weighed, uh, I weighed about... 200 and almost 230 pounds when I did that role. I didn't gain the weight for that role. Uh, <laughs> I had just kind of like now with COVID, you know, I've put on about probably five to seven pounds with COVID. Um, and I watched that. We went to the theater to see the premiere and I looked at myself and I went, holy crap, I've got to lose some weight. <laughs> I just, you know, I can lean in, as you say, lean into my bald characterness and be the fat bald guy, but I, that's not who I, and for my health reasons, uh, I didn't want to be the fat bald guy. I heard you talk about where you would like to go, where you're at now. You know, the recurring role seems to be something that you would be very interested in. Um, but what about indie films? I, I see a lot of indie films uh, because I go to film festivals. I was part of the press this year at Sundance Film Festival. And it seems to be a completely different world than the television world. Um, do you do you see if the, if this was a Venn diagram in your life, um, is there an overlap there that would give you opportunities to audition for indie films? Do you have connections with indie directors? And is that, is that something that is interesting to you as a way to sort of expand your um, your resume. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, I, I audition for plenty of indie films as well. Uh, and, th- and those usually will still come through your agent. I mean, that's how you get the majority of your, your jobs, your auditions, is, you know, a script is written, a production company picks it up. They get a higher casting director. The casting director breaks down the script, decides who these characters are description wise and all. They send it out to the agents. The agents say, I want, you know, Bob and Steve and Larry and James and Joe to read for this role. They send it to the casting director and they go, well, we only want Bob, Larry and Steve. We don't want James. We don't want Larry. We don't want Mo. So then those three actors put themselves on tape or in the old days before COVID, we would actually go in person and read for the role. Same thing on indie films. The problem with a lot of indie films, not a lot, some indie films is they're non-union mm-hmm. and they're on a very low budget. They may only be, you know, 150000 200000 Well, they can't. I saw one that came out yesterday uh, on a breakdown and they want name actors, but they're only paying $300 a day. <laughs> okay. I submitted, because I saw it, so I submitted myself for one of the role because I'm thinking, you know, hey, dumbass. You're not going to get a name actor for $300 a day. If you're going to post it, then just say salary negotiable, 
supporting roles will make $300 a day. Mm-hmm. But you can't put name, talent, name only, star name, right. <laughs> and expect to pay them $300 a day. Um, so yeah, the, some of them are non-union. Uh, what I found is a lot of the non-union, they don't hire a casting director. The producer or the director or the writer sometimes is the same person. Producing, directing, and writing is all the same person. They're doing their own. They may put it out on a website to look for people. They start calling their buddies. And that's why I said I haven't networked well, although I've tried in Texas. I have not been able to network well, uh, and I don't know why. Um, I see my friends on social media posting, I'm on set. And I'm like, well, why didn't I read for that role? What? <laughs> What happened? You know, is it non-union? It, did, you know, and then you see there was no casting director. It was cast by the writer director. He also did the casting. So yeah, he's bringing in his buddies. You know, uh, people that he knows, people that he's worked with, and then he maybe is posting something on a website. And if it's on a website and it says non-union, SAG will tell us as actors go ahead and apply for it. But here's what happens. One of two things. One, they'll look at it and go, well, he's union. Don't bother. Mm. Or they'll bring you in. You audition for it. They say, we like you. Then SAG wants you as the actor to try to turn it to become a union set. Oh, okay. And it's like, okay, hey, guys, I'm glad you like me. You know, I want to do this part. But to do it, I need you to do a SAG. So now they have to take money out of their budget and put it into an account. Yeah. For SAG. Just not worth it for him, probably. No, you've, yeah. you've got to take the money. I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not a huge supporter of the Screen Actors Guild, especially of this last year with the way they've handled things. But they've got to take money out of their budget and put it over here because if there's any difficulties, if there's any problems or issues later on, SAG can go to that account to take money out to make sure you get paid if there's a penalty or something you're due. Right. Well, if I've only got a $200,000 budget, I can't take $25,000 and go put it into an account somewhere right. that I can't use. I need that every dime I've got. So I don't, I, I don't usually audition for anything uh, that's non-union. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I'm glad you explained that, that uh, dichotomy to me because, or at least that, that separation. Um, yeah. That if you're, in the, if you're in SAG and you're in the television and film world um, with SAG, it's there's a barrier there to kind of put your foot in that indie film world and um, same thing with the indie film folks who are not sag they can't get sag jobs on on television series well <clears throat> in in most cases um like we like texas is a right to work state atlanta's a right to work state you can do union and non-union your whole life because it's right to work you don't have to join If you go to New Mexico, if you go to New York, if you go to Los Angeles, after you do your second or third job, and it's a union job, you've got to join. Okay. It's what's referred to as a must join. So you have to do it. Um, But if you're in Texas, I mean, I was SAG eligible for 15 years, and I never joined. I didn't join until I got to Los Angeles and booked my first job. Mm. And that's when they said, well, you've already been what's referred to as a taft Hartley." You've already had a Taft-Hartley before. You're SAG eligible. You can do one job in California without joining, but your second job, I think it was the second job, you've got to join. Okay. So I went ahead and just joined. So you get health insurance with SAG? Is that the benefit or? You have to qualify for it. And that's another reason why I'm upset with SAG this year. They just, they used to have, I used to qualify for it back in the old days. I like using that term apparently. Um, You had to make like, I don't know, $10,000. And this was back in the 90s. And scale rate for the day was, you know, maybe $600 for the day. Well, you got to book a lot of one-day jobs or, you know, hope that you get a two-day job or maybe even book a week-long guest star to make ten grand in a year to qualify for your health insurance. Hmm. Now, there's always money being put into a pension, but you have to qualify yearly to uh, get that pension back as a retirement later on. Got it. So you still have to make so much money. You may have money going into a pension fund in your name, but if you don't have a qualifying year, like for a long time, I only had four qualifying years, although I had been acting for 10 or 15 years. I only had four years that I qualified for that pension. So if I retired, I'm never going to see that money. On the health insurance this last year, they bumped it. 
it went up, I think it was 17,000 and for tier one and then tier two was the better insurance as if you made like 30 or 32,000. Well, they combined them all. There's no tiers anymore. Now you have to make like 25,000 and something dollars. Mm. That's a pretty there high bar. There aren't that many actors in the Screen Actors Guild that are going to make $25,000. Now, understandably, there are a lot of people that you've never seen in your entire life that make two, three hundred, four hundred, a million dollars a year because they're voiceover actors. They're doing, you know, I've got a buddy that does uh, uh, Dragon Ball Z or whatever it is and Black Butler, and he does all these characters and all these voices and mm -hmm. stuff. You, you, you never know him. I knew a guy that retired and moved to Connecticut and you know, bought a beautiful house after he retired and he was making $200,000 a year. And all he does is commercial and video games mm -hmm. and voiceover for animated films and cartoons. Oh, they do really well. Yeah. Yeah. They, they can do very well. I interviewed Rob Paulson on this show and he is mm -hmm. the voice of Raphael from uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Timmy. Turtles and uh, Pinky and the Brain. And, uh, but man, talk about a, gu a guy who's just tuned into all of these really high paying projects. Well, look at Homer Simpson. Oh, yeah. Oh, if you goodness. see if you see the actor who does the voice of Homer Simpson in real life, and I actually did a, a um, I auditioned for something where he was at, and I didn't know who he was. <laughs> of course not. I recognized his face, right. you know, and then somebody goes, oh, that's the guy that does Homer. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, holy crap. He's out here reading for reporter number two uh -huh. in this movie. Because he's making this huge living doing doing Homer Simpson and all this other stuff. He's just having fun. But yet fun. he was out there yeah. reading for a supporting role in some film too. But you don't recognize his face. Man, you, you should so, have yeah, gone they, up to they, him and said, dude, what are you doing? Why are you competing? You're, why are you taking my job? <laughs> I actually said that to William Forsyth uh, when I was up working on that movie I told you about earlier with uh, Josh Hartnett. Uh, William Forsyth's in the film. And there were two movies back to back, not this movie, but two movies back to back that were shooting in Oklahoma. And uh, it was the same production team that did both movies. <laughs> and they hired William Forsyth for, and the first one was a really good role, a really good role. And they hired William Forsyth for like one of the two leads. And I was one of the three finalists. That's what I was told. I didn't know that my competition was William Forsyth. <laughs> and if you if you look up William Forsyth, for, the, for your fans that don't know him, you will immediately recognize his face as soon as you see him. And um, while, I guess while he was there, because he was already there, another film was getting ready to go into production. And this was written as a, a day player. It was only going to work for one, maybe two days. Well, they hired William Forsyth to do the role. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Why is William Forsyth doing this role? Well, they turned it into a cameo so they could use his recognizable name and face. Oh, okay. So while I'm in uh, Oklahoma this last time, <laughs> I walked up and I'm handling him his pistol and we're talking and all. I said, hey, can you do me a favor? And he goes, yeah. I said, would you stop taking the roles that I've been auditioning for? <laughs> Good for he you. Laughed. He needs to be told that. I mean, that guy's... He, he laughed. Yeah. Well, he said, he said, James, I've been there. Yeah. He says, I've been the guy, even as a recognizable face and name, going, I read for this role. I was really good. I was right for this role. And, you know, then they went and got J.T. Walsh or, you know, Tom mm -hmm. Cruise or whoever. Right. They, they went to that next level. He says, so I've been there in your position and I've been there in my position. He says, I lose out roles to people... Because uh, I told him, I can't compete against your resume, right. even if I were a better actor than him, which I'm certainly not. Uh, but even if I was a better actor, I can't compete against his resume. Right. And for my listeners who don't know who, what, what William's uh, background is or his claim to fame, I mean, he's got a lot, lot Ton. of projects on IMDb. But m where I know him best is from Raising Arizona, where he was John Goodman's basically partner in crime and yeah. um, one of the classic comedies of uh of the 80s he's on and, boardwalk empire yeah. too on hbo so oh another he's, great series another yeah. great series yeah um our great yeah that's a raising arizona is not a series but boardwalk no. empire is, is one of my favorite hbo series uh created james it was a real pleasure getting to know you in this format hearing your story and uh, I will do my best to put all of your social media information on the show notes. I won't go yeah. into that here. Follow me. Yeah, I'm but you, you've Instagram got Instagram and Twitter. A, a nice social media presence, and I'll, I'll put that in the show notes and uh, link to your IMDb. 
And um, thank you yeah. for your time. You, I was going to say real quick, because um, uh, it's easy to find me. It's just James Healy and then put actor on the end of it. And when you look at the ugly bald guy, you know it's me. You found me. <laughs> um, but here's here's something. When you go to the IMDb, it doesn't matter to the average Joe, but there's a thing on there called a star meter, and it means absolutely nothing. But when you go to the main page, you look on the top right by my picture or something, there's this little green or red thing that looks like a scale, either going up or going down. Mm -hmm. And it's based upon people clicking on your page, whether that little green goes up or it turns red and it goes down. Mm -hmm. And again, nobody pays attention to it, but as actors, we're sitting there and you're like, one day it's, you know, you're 49,255 and the next day you're 97,750 and you're like, how did I drop 50 points in a week? You know, every week it's updated and when you watch it, which you're not supposed to, but when you watch it go up and down like that, especially dramatic turns, it's kind of weird. And then you find out it's it's all based upon somebody clicking on your page. Oh, that's fun. So you're you're constantly going, could you could you click on my page for me, please? Well, James, <laughs> you'll be pleased to know that you're up this week to twenty five thousand one hundred and seventy three. Yeah, I, I went from seventy five to like forty nine or something. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, James Healy Jr. Thanks for being on the podcast, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a good night. All right. You too. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.